Hello, welcome back to the Eros Recap. Ba -ba -da -ba 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 -ba. Hope you're ready. This one's going to be a big old chunky one. I've recorded this so many times and I keep messing it up because there's too many words. Fingers crossed. <laughs> this will be the one that makes it. <laughs> <laughs> Let's rock and roll. On the shores of Voxar, the party gather together to grieve their fallen friend Sentry. But next to Sentry's body is a strange cylindrical tube with a glowing light emanating from it. Nova takes a look at it and recognises it as the fragment of a star. An item so powerful it has the energy to imbue a spell with the power to bring back the dead. After a quiet moment, the group then decide to somehow try and bring Sentry back to life. And they begin making the slow journey inland to find assistance with Ayla carrying Sentry on her back. On the road, the group encounter a half-orc woman being attacked by a group of lizard folk. The half-orc spots the party and calls them over to help her out. The party oblige and together they take down the lizard folk. And after their fight, introductions are made. The half-orc introduces herself as Araya Marius. <laughs> <laughs> and she is my character numero do numero do numero two number two <laughs> um she has like a huge green and gold trimmed pirate hat with like a griffin feather in its uh, in its peak uh she has a green and gold trimmed captain's coat she has a bow and arrow daggers she's well armed she's ready to go she's got an awesome rapier as well Mariah tells the party that she works as a monster slayer and a guide for the local town and warns the group that the land here is filled with magical storms, with great destructive power. And as they're talking, the group hear a rumble of thunder and lightning crashing to the ground nearby. So Araya desperately leads them to the nearby village of Stenhill, and picking their moment and racing against the clock, they rush to the nearby town. Stenhill's a really cool town. It's built on a floodplain, so all of the houses are built on stilts and raised up to protect them from flooding. Araya leads the group to a temple of Kalara, the goddess of death and are introduced to the priestess Skaldi Ravenscar. She's a really cool dwarven woman with like with long blonde hair all dressed in black, dark black makeup over her eyes and she has black ribbons in her hair. She sees the party are in big trouble and she helps to heal them and she casts a ward over Sentry's body to protect her from decay which helps buy the party more time to help her. However in return she asks that the party perform a small favour for her since they look strong and capable. Nearby are some ruins of a battle that took place long ago called the Night Eye. Scaldi tells the party that it's been rumoured a necromancer has been living in the ruins and has been summoning violent spirits and spectres to attack anyone that comes near. The party decide to get some rest and have a think about what they want to do. Raya, Lucius and Ayla go to look for somewhere to rest and they come across the Traveller's Inn where inside they meet Vexen Dexit Galloway, the tiefling owner of the tavern, with red skin, fiery golden eyes, dressed in a loose white shirt and tight leather trousers. He gives the party a very very warm welcome, and a place to sleep in exchange for gold and a story. Quill rests in the temple of Kalara with Sentry, and as he's healing he receives a message from his god Hesper. Hesper tells Quill about Starbane's first assault on Arois, and warns Quill of Callus's growing cunning and strength, before explaining to Quill why Myrskir is plagued by these terrible storms. The storms are a byproduct of an old friend who fell during the Sundering. The Tempest Dragon fell into the mountains, where the Court of Shadows sent Zarkira and a small army to claim the power as their own, but in doing so, unleashed the Storm Dragon's terrible fury. And now the storms rage out of control, they are unstoppable and they've been getting worse. Before the vision ends, in the morning the group return to the temple to find Quill all healed and ready to go. Skaldi asks if they'd like to perform a speak with dead ritual with Sentry. The group agree, but before they can get started, a deep booming voice resonates from Sentry's body. The voice gives the party two instructions, to find the Prime and to return Sentry's body to the City of Glass. The group are a little bit freaked out, but then they assume that it's just part of Sentry's strange programming, and they sit down to perform the Speak with Dead ritual. They learn of Sentry's wishes to return back to the group, and they find out that her favourite colour is green. Scaldi tells the party that there are a couple of ways they could revive Sentry if they wish to. They could take Sentry to the city of Katavag, a large coastal settlement, where there they'll find a wizard called the Shepherd, who could cast a reincarnate spell on her, which would bring Sentry back, but could bring her back as an entirely different race. Or they could go to the Midwife's Forge, a place that's rumoured where witches grant magical favours. The team have a think to weigh out the safest and most achievable option, and while doing 
doing so, they decide to help Skaldi solve the mystery of the Night Eye ruins. The party leave Sentry safe at the temple and begin their journey to the Night Eye. The roads around Mirskir are treacherous, with Araya guiding them. The party are attacked multiple times along the way by Mirskir's strange and unique creatures, but they successfully arrive at the ruins in one piece, and once they arrive, they witness the remains of what must have been a terrible battle between Kallus Starbane and Aroas. The remains of a giant metal war machine lay half buried in the dirt, as well as the skeletal remains of warriors who fell hundreds of years ago. Nova alerts the group to the presence of a Tiangong shard, which must be somewhere nearby, and suddenly ghostly, horrible spirits rise up from the ground and begin to attack the party. After a tough battle, Nova discovers the underwater entrance to the ruins, and the group hesitantly make their way inside, with Lucius kicking up a right old stink about getting his clothes all mucky and dirty and smelly. The water the level rises the deeper they go, so the party send Nova ahead to look for air pockets, since she doesn't need to breathe underwater. The group successfully manage to avoid trouble, until they come into a strange chamber. As they make their way in, the door shuts behind them, and an arcane ballista starts firing at the group narrowly avoiding a complete disaster. The group somehow managed to make their way out, with Ayla getting really, really mad, <laughs> summoning all of her power to destroy the turret that nearly killed all of them. The group managed to find a dry ledge and haul themselves up to take a short rest. After their rest, the party venture further into the ruins, and eventually they find a glorious golden room. Along the walls are scribings of all of the various gods of Aroas, and at the very end is a giant statue to Siaska. But between between the party and the statue is a tiled floor, and each of those tiles has a different symbol to different gods scattered along them, all in what seems to be a random pattern. The group sit there for a moment and try to ponder the puzzle that lays before them, before seeing that to either side of the room are two doors. So the group split off and have a look at each of the doors. Both of the corridors are identical and both curve around the room. But before they make their way inside, circular bladed saws activate and start travelling along tracks dug into the floor. The group reconvene and decide that maybe they can disarm the traps and make their way down one of the corridors. The party all head to the left hand side corridor and working together they manage to jam the trap so they can make their way through safely. The group make their way down the corridor, and at the end they enter a strange stone room, surrounded by stone pillars and what looks like an altar in the centre, with offerings to Siaska made upon it. And as the group try to figure out what's going on, a strange blue sphere starts descending from the ceiling, and at its centre is a tri-bladed throwing dagger the Tiang Gong Shard. But before the group can do anything about it, a figure starts emerging from the shard, and before the party stands a tall, slender figure, dressed in dark, tattered robes, with armour fit tightly against their body. Dark, inky black hair flows over a silver mask that covers their entire face, and the figure produces a long, red blade, which pulses with a terrifying red energy. Nova raises her own sword, Tiang Gong. The shard flies across the room and binds itself to Tiangong. Tiangong's form shifts and becomes the same tri-bladed throwing knife, absorbing the power from the extra shard. The figure reveals themselves to be an ex-agent of Starbane and that they know who the party are, before launching into a terrifying combat. Power the party have never seen before, but the party respond with as much strength as they can offer, and they begin to overwhelm the figure. In a final devastating attack, the worshipper removes their mask, revealing where a face should be, just darkness, and a single red point in the centre of the face. A devastating red beam emanates from the single red point and knocks down Quill. The party rush, desperate to save their friend, but the worshipper summons great Great walls of ice between Quill and the party, stopping them from getting to him. The party can't reach him in time, and Quill dies, his spirit passing over to the world beyond. The party, filled with rage, managed to knock down the attacker, with Lucius drawing colours from Quill's robes to fire an acid arrow in the shape of a feather, and as the robed figure vanishes away into nothing, the party grieve another fallen friend. In their grief, they are visited by the god Atelicus, who tells the group that Quill is safe with him, and that the offerings to Siaska can be taken as a thanks for their efforts. The party loot the tomb before beginning the solemn journey back to Stenhill. The distraught party make camp on the road. During the night, Tiang Gong, now shaped as the tri-bladed throwing knife, shows Nova a distant memory. A pulsing red dot surrounded by stars in the depths of space. The red star of Hadar 
hungers. Nova in tears explains what Tiang Gong has just shown her, and upon hearing the name Hadar, Ayla's mind transports her back to a memory of her own. Ayla as a child, surrounded by warriors preparing for battle, the distinctive red pattern of her clan's tartan strong in her mind. Looking around, she's not on a Rois, she's on a different world with three moons in the sky. Surrounded by Starbane ships, she watches the elven warriors march on board and hears a deep booming voice shout to defeat Hadar before the memory abruptly ends. The group gather their things and soon arrive back in Stenhill, Ayla gently placing Quill's body alongside Sentry's. The group take a moment to make plans to take both Quill and Sentry's body to the midwife's forge to revive them, but before setting off, a large tremor starts shaking the ground, and strange portals begin appearing around the town. A fire ganassi falls out of one of them. The party are keen to question him. The fire ganassi introduces himself as Piri Adara, and this is Tom's character number two. <laughs> Piri is a tall, nimble, athletic-looking fire ganassi, with grey skin, flicking flames on the top of his head instead of hair, and wearing tight-fitting dark leather armour. Piri tries to activate an odd-looking device on his wrist that kind of looks like a watch but is like Star Trek watch, but as he does so, the watch explodes, sending waves of peculiar energy around Stenhill. The group ask him for more information about where he's come from and what he's doing here, but are soon interrupted as more portals start appearing around Stenhill. Weird, frosty creatures from the ice plains start making their way through, as well as organic looking fungal creatures also start crawling through. And joining them emerges a pixie princess and her entire entourage, and this strange group of creatures starts laying siege to the town of Stenhill. One of the villagers, the mighty Torman, assists the party and puts up a valiant fight, but is sadly killed in the chaos. The group of pixies from the Feywilds start attacking Lucius and constantly put him to sleep in what feels like an endless cycle of sleeping and waking and sleeping and waking. This makes Lucius really angry. <laughs> <laughs> and he kills the pixie princess and her entourage. And after the party in Stenhill come together to take down the weird intruders, Lucius finds a flower crown, which must have been dropped by the pixie princess, and he hesitantly places it on his head. And on doing so, beautiful ethereal butterfly wings sprout from his back. His hair becomes even more long and luscious. Lucius tries to take the crown off, but he can't. The crown is firmly stuck to his head. The party are very excited about Lucius's new appearance, and they feverishly chat amongst themselves as they gather supplies for the long road ahead. They load up a wagon and hitch it to a clack named Scorb. Uh, clacks are like these giant crab-like creatures. Scorb is a good boy, and Scorb likes worms. Piri agrees to come along with the group, hoping that maybe the midwife's forge can help fix his teleportation device. Not too far into the journey, the group come across a fisherman called Johan. Johan, played by Ravs, is a human man wearing powder blue robes. He has long shoulder length brown hair and a bushy unkempt beard, dressed in traveller's garb, carrying a half burnt fishing rod across his back. Johan introduces himself to the group and tells the party about his journey, that he's been following his visions of a one-eyed, one-winged hawk into the mountains, hoping there he'll get some answers about his odd storm powers. Upon hearing the one-eyed, one-winged hawk comment, the party quietly show Johan Quill's body. Johan believes that him and the party are tied to a similar fate, and he joins the party on their journey. Not too long after, the group are ambushed by this crazed group of goblins. They make some amazing noises. They're great. <laughs> <laughs> who believe that the storms give them eternal power, their bodies covered in these gruesome lightning scars. They clamber over the wagon. The party manage to fend them off, but their numbers make things a little more difficult than they would have liked. And they carry on their way until they reach a river. The party attempt to cross the raging torrent, but the turbulent waters wash Quill's body out of the car. Araya, in her own misguided confidence, attempts to swim after the body to rescue it, but she almost drowns. <laughs> <laughs> so Nova casts Thunderstep to rescue Quill's body out of the water, and Araya sheepishly manages to swim her way to shore. After a second and more successful attempt at crossing the river, the group continue their trek into the Rocky Mountains. Johan quickly befriends the party on their journey. He tells the group that he thinks he knows how to banish the storms from the valley, but he needs the group's help to do it. After another day of travel, Johan splits from the group and tells them he'll be waiting for them when the time is right. The group make their way inside a tunnel filled of crystals. Araya tells the party that a basilisk may lurk inside, and she helps guide the party safely through. And they arrive at a gorge where a large statue of the goddess Velena stands over them. Beyond the statue is a series of what looks to be goblin tents. The leader Vesic introduces himself to the party. 
Vesic tells the group that he's been living here by the midwife's forge, trying to figure out for himself how to use it. Inquiring about their visit, Vesic makes a deal with the party, allowing them to use the forge if they know a way to start it. He brings a small cluster of goblins with him, and the party make their way into a tunnel, where at the end lie a large set of double doors. Nova hands Araya the star fragment, and the party make their way inside a stone chamber, where inside Nova recognises what looks to be a console on a raised platform, and in front of the party is a large statue to the goddess Elena. The stone statue begins coming alive, detecting the intruders. Ayla and Araya keep the golem distracted, while Nova dashes up to the console. She deactivates the golem security system, and the statue becomes docile. The group investigate the forge and figure out how to work it, and before Araya can use the star to power the forge, they are met with a treacherous eye, as Veskin points a strange gun-like weapon towards the party. Swirling magical energy pulses in its chamber. They fight, and soon after, Veskin and his goblins are defeated. The party quietly brings Sentry to the forge, and Araya plunges the star fragment into the machine, and Sentry is brought back to life. Before Sentry wakes, the silent dark that was occupying her mind fades away into a memory. She sees the Solvin Palace and the Astoria royal family before her. The queen and a young princess are huddled in a chamber as stone and brick crumble around them. Waves and water begin flooding the room as the king draws out a ritual circle before them, with Sentry holding up her shield protecting him from debris. The spell finishes and the royal family disappear in a flash of light as Sentry is thrown into the sea and eventually darkness takes her until she is woken by a familiar face, Quill. Sentry feels power surging through her body once more as she steps out of the forge, her stone armour now replaced with metal plate. She greets her friends warmly and excitedly, but she soon notices that Quill is not there to greet her. After an emotional and difficult conversation with Sentry, the party spend some time at the forge upgrading their weapons. Ayla combines her warhammer with a lightning javelin that she found on the way, allowing her to throw her giant hammer like a boomerang with devastating power. It's amazing! And Piri fixes his broken watch, revealing that now it's fixed he can help teleport the party to the sky city of Gusthaven, where they could find a way to bring back Quill. The party soon set off, but in doing so are followed by a very curious goblin called Smeek who seems absolutely obsessed with Ayla's lightning power. Smeek the goblin joins the party! <laughs> but as the party grows once more, Araya, Scaldi and Scorb say their farewells to the party, making their way back home to Stenhill, while Piri gathers the group and they teleport to Lucius's home city of Gusthaven. On their arrival, Piri leads the team for a cipher storage system, but the group aren't alone and they discover the storage system is being ransacked by a group called the Wind Barons. The party try to stop the raiders, but are stopped by the Gusthaven City Watch, who summon a mage to finally confirm Lucius's true identity. The mage is oddly surprised at Lucius's arrival to Gusthaven, after believing that he died in an airship crash a month ago. The mage pulls Lucius aside for a quiet word, and leads the party to the Elanasto family estate, which now lies in ruin with smoke billowing from the rubble, and Lucius is told that an explosion had taken place on his family home and that no one survived. And that's the end of chapter 5! <laughs> All done and dusted! <laughs> As the party find themselves in yet more mystery. But yeah, take care of yourselves guys, see you all in chapter 6 where we figure out what's going on in Gusthaven, and I'll see you again very soon. Take care, be safe, and goodbye. See you soon! Crab.